Hello, everybody. Good morning, uh, good afternoon for you, wherever you are. Welcome to this uh, webinar session by MIGAR for CLAMP on ground testing. Our presenter today is uh, uh, Mr. Jeff. He is from our US uh, sales team. Uh, he will be presenting on uh, uh, CLAMP on ground testing and attach road technique. Uh, please remember that at any given time during the webinar session, uh, you are allowed to put any question you want in the question uh, 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 pane. Uh, at the end of the webinar, uh, all the question will be answered uh, by me. So without further ado, uh, we will start now the uh, webinar. Please remind this is a recorded webinar. It's been done previously. Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in to today's Clamp on Ground Testing webinar. I am <clears throat> Meredith Kenton and I will be moderating this presentation. I'm the Digital Marketing Specialist here at Megger. Um, if you have any questions regarding webinars in general, feel free to reach out to me. On the right hand side of your screen, you should see a panel just like this one. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them here. Uh, at the conclusion of the presentation, our presenter will answer as many questions as possible. Don't worry if your question isn't answered, we will be sending out answers to all of the questions to everyone who attended today um, in the days following the presentation. Our presenter today is Jeff Jowett. He's our senior applications engineer. If you have any questions specific to ground testing or clamp on ground testing, please reach out to him directly. And on that, I will give it over to Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone to our webinar. Uh, our previous webinar was uh, introduction to ground testing and instrumentation. Uh, and today we're going to look at some alternate techniques. So if you attended the previous webinar, you know that we talked about the fundamental instrumentation that is employed in testing grounds and that would be your three and four terminal testers that have been around forever and there's a couple of alternate technologies that we're going to take a look at in this webinar the clamp on which is basically a uh, substitute for three and four terminal testers and art met what we call art method which is really not a uh, a replacement of three and four terminal testers, but rather it's an enhancement of that type of technology. Okay, next. A quick look at uh, the background of what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, a little bit of review involved here. Uh, ground has a number of different definitions. So uh, in, in the electrical industry in general. So you do have to be careful when the word ground is used. It means different things to different people. But um, what we're looking at today is a grounding electrode, which is to say a piece of metal that's installed in the ground. And the purpose of it is to get unwanted currents out of your electrical system, uh, fault currents from disturbances on the utility, and then, of course, the one that everybody thinks about is the lightning strikes, and that certainly is huge, especially in some areas. And then, in addition, there are static charges, which can become dangerous or damaging, and noise. So your grounding electrode, the point of that is its function is to get that out of your electrical system uh, before it presents a danger or uh, uh, any kind of destruction. Okay, next. These are the quick review of the basic uh, functions and uh, benefits that you get out of having a good ground. The main one, of course, is that it lessens the chance of injury or electrocution because you don't want to have voltage gradients across your equipment due to 
being ungrounded and there's a problem on the electrical system and the human being accidentally touches something metallic and and the person becomes the path to ground so you want to avoid that you want to have a very low impedance alternate path to ground to bypass uh, any uh, human being that comes in contact and then secondly of course is damage to equipment so again an alternate path to ground prevents fault currents from circulating around in your electrical plant and causing damage and then the final one is noise and similar uh, low current problems that nevertheless become large in comparison when they're circulating through sensitive equipment like computer and communication. Next. So the first technology that we're gonna take a look at uh, is the clamp-on and let's see. Uh, sorry, I'm losing. Uh, track of the number of slides here. Uh, we'll be looking at the clamp-on technology, and uh, this is a, a quick review then of the things that we're going to be covering. Next. The basic methodology is this. Uh, it has A clamp-on ground tester has uh, two coils uh, two windings in the jaw. So when you, you typically you're thinking of clamp on instruments is used like an ammeter, for instance, there's usually one winding. But in this case, we've got both a current and a potential winding in the jaws of the clamp on tester. And the way it works is that the uh, Current winding in, induces into your grounding system. You've clamped over your ground rod or you've clamped over uh, the grounding conductor that's coming out of the service entrance, and you're inducing a current into the uh, grounding system. And the current then circulates back to the jaws. We'll talk about that. And then uh, it, you have a loop, and it measures the voltage drop around the loop, and it uses those two factors to calculate out the resistance of the entire loop and that's what you see on the jaws uh, on the display excuse me next so it requires a complete electrical circuit and it's going to measure the complete resistance of the loop so this is uh, i should mention by the way that uh, it typically uses a high frequency our, our models use uh, 1390 hertz. Uh, reason for this primarily is because uh, you want to have it small enough to fit in your hand. And in order to uh, generate a signal, then uh, higher frequency is used in order to be able to reduce the size of the tester. You couldn't have a very big tester. It just wouldn't work because of the dimensions, the physical dimensions of the things, areas that you're working in and the things that you're trying to clamp on. So so that's the frequency that's used on our models. Uh, you do need to have a complete electrical circuit in order to make a measurement. We'll come back to this uh, again and again during the course of the presentation. Um, they're the basic problems that you have to deal with and be aware of are shorts and opens, and we'll come back to that. So you're measuring a loop resistance around an electrical loop. Next. So here's a simplified schematic then of how this works. Um, you'll note that we specify the two windings in the jaws, voltage and current. You're clamping on a ground rod that's part of a system where you have parallel return, low resistance grounds that the clamp on is gonna make use of. And typically this would be your grounded utility neutral. So when you energize the clamp on, it's going to send a signal through the earth, an induced signal through the earth, which is then going to find the uh, grounded utility neutral and return back through the grounded neutral to the jaws. 
And now the tester is then going to calculate out the complete resistance of that entire loop. And so we see the calculation for it on the lower left. Rx is what we're trying to measure. And the other term there is the, the rest of the return paths that are also contributing to the resistance. But note on the lower right, what we're showing you is that Rx, in order for this to work efficiently, Rx must be much, much greater than that other term. In other words, the return path. And we can think of this uh, a more uh, standard method that most people are aware of, what, what they call dead earth, which would be with a traditional three or four terminal tester, you would run a couple of leads over to some convenient return like the water pipe system, and you would measure the resistance of that loop, and you would assume that the water pipe system has a very low resistance, and so you would assume that what you see on your display is a good, accurate measurement of your test ground, but in the real world, that, that often wasn't true, and you could get a lot of distortion and a lot of uh, faulty measurements out of that. So the, the, the uh, clamp-on technique took that idea of the dead earth method and refined it substantially by finding a return path that actually contributes very little to your measurement. But bear in mind, uh, these measurements are always going to read a little bit high because of the return path. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, next slide. So this is a recap then, uh, basically what we're talking about. You wanna have a, a path that includes the mass of the earth along with a convenient return of low resistance. And so your clamped electrode should have most of the resistance that you see on your display. Next. And here's another schematic representation. This would be one of the most ideal applications of a clamp on, which would be whole grounds. Uh, it's one of, one of the best applications for it and where it was first applied. Uh, you have a series of whole grounds. And up at the top, we see the grounded utility neutral that's paralleled these all together. Okay, next. So now in the next two slides, we're going to compare the uh, traditional method with the clamp on, and we're gonna look at electrically how the two methods function and they actually function kind of in opposition to each other. Here we see the hookup of a traditional tester. This would be like a three or four terminal tester. And we, we just didn't draw the tester itself in, into the picture. Uh, but what we're applying here is that you've got a three or four terminal tester and it's hooked up and it's connected to one of these grounds in a series of pole grounds. And so now what happens is when you energize the tester, the test current is going to go to ground and it's going to return by means of the current probe, which you see on the right side of your screen, and that's some distance away, and that completes your return path. So if you were to hook up a traditional tester in this configuration and try to get a measurement, what would happen is you wouldn't just measure that ground that we see that you're hooked to, but because of the grounded neutral at the top, your test current is going to return through all six of those grounds. So you'd get a good measurement, except it wouldn't be of that one pole. It would be of the parallel resistance to ground of all six of those poles. Next. Now, by contrast, the clamp on does the reverse. And here, with the clamp on energizing a current, the only place that that current can go is into the ground through the clamped electrode. And then it will re return by the other five. So now your test loop is in the reverse uh, direction of what we just saw using a three or four terminal tester. So in this case, you can actually read the resistance of the clamped electrode and the other five are 
contributing relatively little to the measurement. And that's fundamentally uh, how this technique works and one of the strengths of this technique. Next. So for those of you who like math, uh, just as a little exercise, you can do this. You can see that if you had uh, relatively few return paths, in this case six, and you had a 10 ohm ground, and they were all the same, uh, your, your error contributed by the return path would be about two ohms. So you would measure about 12 ohms on your display, and that's really not too good a measurement for a 10 ohm ground. But if you had a large number of returns, let's say 60 grounded poles, now if you do the math, your return uh, is reduced to 0 0.17, 0 0.17 ohm. So that's not much of an error. So that gives you a pretty good measurement. So uh, this is a pretty good illustration then of how your return path affects your measurement. And if you have a sufficiently low resistance return path through the utility, you're going to get a good accurate measurement. Next. Okay, now we'll start looking at some specific applications. Um, in this case, we've got a pole ground that has not only a rod, but also the butt plate is part of the ground. And so uh, this is a common configuration. And here you've clamped at the right spot. If you clamp above the two grounds, then your test current is going to go to ground through the rod and through the butt plate, and it's going to return by the other poles, and you're going to get a good accurate measurement of the grounding of this particular pole. Now, suppose you've got a lot of weeds and stuff growing up, and it's hard to see uh, you know, uh, where to clamp, and let's suppose you accidentally got onto the little connection between the butt plate and the ground rod. And if you clamped onto that, all you would get is a very short loop from the rod to the butt plate and around and around. And you'd get a real low rating or run off the low end of the scale. Well, if you ran off the low end of the scale, you'd suspect that something was wrong. But if you got a real low rating, you might uh, accidentally think that that's a measurement and you'd think, oh man, I got a great measurement here, it's way below an ohm because you're only measuring that very short loop. So you don't have enough earth in that type of configuration. So the point of this is to illustrate that these, one of the dangers of these testers in a way is that they're too easy. And so the operator, we do not ever want to take the operator out of the operation. So the, the person operating the test really should know what is the electrical configuration of your system and where are you clamping and why? Don't, don't just inadvertently clamp at some convenient point and walk off. Know your system and know what you're measuring. Next. Here's another good example, service entrance. Uh, here we show two rods. That could be a whole array. That could be 20 rods. It doesn't really matter. The, the test current would go to ground through all of them, and it would return by the grounded utility, and you would get a good accurate measurement in this configuration. Next. Another example here, we've used the water pipe system. This is a common uh, grounding method, and again, this would work quite well. Your test current would go to ground through the water pipe system and find a return. The water companies don't always like this, and I think in some municipalities, I think this is actually banned, but that has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. That's a separate issue. Okay, next. Here's an example then of, again, of a, uh, a service panel uh, with a ground rod or a grounded system. Doesn't matter if this was a grid or what it is, we just show a rod this would be a good configuration and this would work. Next. Now here we need operator influence a little bit more. Here we've got a pad mount transformer. Uh, you can clamp on the 
on the grounding conductor going to the grounding electrode, and you're going to return through the concentric neutral. Uh, you would hope that that is sufficiently far enough away that you're going to travel through a sufficient volume of earth. So the operator needs to make these type of considerations uh, before getting your test result and entering it as a as an actual result. Okay, next. Similar type of configuration here. Uh, note we show two ground rods. This could be a whole array of ground rods. It doesn't matter as long as you get above the whole array. So you would want your clamp to be placed between your ground connection to the uh, uh, to the uh, object that you're, you're uh, in this case, the uh, pad mount transformer and the grounding array. If you got between the ground rods, let's say on the dotted line, then again, you would have a short loop, wouldn't tell you anything, it would be worthless. So again, know your electrical system. Next. And here's another good example. Uh, here you have a transmission tower that's uh, 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 mounted on a, a pad mount, an electrical, uh, excuse me, a, a concrete uh, base. And in this case, what we show is that the rebar uh, in the concrete base is part of the grounding system. Now, that there's nothing wrong with that. Rebar is a good ground. It's what is referred to as a Eufer ground, and there's nothing wrong with using that as your ground. But note, we've also got a ground rod off the pad mount. So the point of this is, um, with respect to fault clearance, if you're clearing a, a very like a maximum fault, that can put a lot of strain on the concrete, and it can damage the concrete base. So it's a good idea to have an additional rod off to the side to take the crest of the, or the front of a large fault clearance and not have it going all through the rebar and possibly damaging the, the structure. So you'd want to have a parallel system similar to this. But again, if you're doing a clamp on measurement, make sure you're above the point at which the two parallel grounds diverge. If you got further downstream, if you went over on the head of the ground rod, then your test current would merely circulate back to the rebar. You'd have kind of a short circuit there and you'd get a real nice low reading, but it would not be an accurate reading of this grounding protection. So again, the operator wants to know the electrical configuration of the system. Next. Here we've got a pedestal. I think this is uh, uh, probably needs to be uh, upgraded a little bit. This would probably be uh, inside a, uh, a pad mount cover, casing or covering or whatever. But the basic idea is this may maybe a little bit old, but the basic idea would be that you're circulating back to that would be the shield that it would be. Uh, using as the return path. And again, uh, a convenient means of me uh, measuring a pedestal ground. Next. Okay, now this, is this is kind of interesting. Uh, this is showing a uh, telephone cabinet. And here we see the clamp on being uh, used in two different ways. And again, this is an illustration uh, what the operator needs to input his knowledge or her knowledge before actually recording a test result. And the clamp on that we show to the left of the screen is doing a ground resistance measurement like you would expect. The clamp on to the right of the sc screen is doing a continuity measurement of the grounding conductor. So if you clamped over the head of the rod, as on the left side of the screen, and your test current would find a return path through the grounded utility neutral, and you'd get a good reading of the grounding of the cabinet. But now, in this case, the 
line that we show representing the grounding conductor wouldn't actually be outside the cabinet. That's just for depiction purposes. It would be circulating around up inside the cabinet and connecting to various components that you want to have grounded. But the point is that if you clamped on that anywhere on that grounding conductor, you'd get a measurement. But what you'd be seeing is the continuity of that grounding conductor rather than the grounding resistance. So if you got a high number, you'd look inside and see if you have a bad connection somewhere. And so it would be a good test, but it's a continuity test, not a ground resistance test. So a clamp on is a good means of doing one or the other. Just make sure you're aware of your electrical configuration and know which one you're doing so that you don't accidentally confuse uh, continuity tests or bonding tests. I guess it's a better description of it. It's a bonding test, but you don't want to confuse that with a grounding test. Okay, next. Uh, now, this one uh, is kind of outdated, and uh, I have to comment that, as some of you may know, in our industry, uh, power and telecom are totally different, and uh, they're two completely different arenas, and I am a power guy. I am not a telecom guy, so we are anticipating in the future running a similar webinar on telecom exclusively so those of you who are in that industry you want to watch for that and we'll give you more thorough information on the particulars of telecom grounding this is just a general example where you've installed a, a jumper in order to make your test okay next now we want to look at two examples of where a clamp on should not be used or cannot be used. And so again, you apply this to your general system that you're wishing to measure. So here we've got a tower ground and note that you've got a ring ground. This is a, a uh, common configuration around a tower. You've got a ring ground and then your guy wires are part of the grounding system. So if you clamped anywhere on this, all you would get is a test uh, current, a test signal following its own path, and it can go up the guy wire to the top and down the other guy wires to the ring and around the ring, and you're going to get a beautifully low reading here, but it doesn't mean much of anything. That's uh, the, the test current is not being forced to enter the earth. It just can find a path, a much more convenient path around metal. And so you're not going to get a ground resistance test out of this configuration. Next. Here we've got a substation and everything is bonded in a Faraday cage. This is equipotential everywhere. And you want that because you don't want a voltage gradient anywhere that a human being could come in contact with and become part of a path to ground. So you cannot use a clamp on to measure the ground resistance of a substation. However, you can do a very convenient continuity test. If you had a fence post that's supposed to be connected to the buried grid underneath and you've got a jumper going down to the grid and you can clamp over that and if you get a high reading well then you you've lost continuity so you may want to dig a hole there and see what happened the jumper may have uh, disconnected from the grid and that would be a potential point of getting a voltage gradient which you do not want so uh, the clamp on ground tester is good and the utilities commonly use it in this configuration as a real quick and easy bonding test and then if there's you know if they're anticipating a problem or whatever there's more complex and more thorough instrumentation that you can use to test bonding but this is certainly a quick and convenient way to spot potential problems so again the operator know what your configuration is and know what you're testing 
Okay, next. Now here we show a uh, another type of clamp-on test, and this would be with a four-terminal tester. And these are now on the market where, uh, where instead of using a, a handheld clamp on like we've been referring to since the beginning of the presentation, but instead in this configuration, uh, this is what is commonly referred to in the literature as a stakeless test. Uh, here we've got a pretty sophisticated four terminal tester. These are now available on the market where instead of a single clamp on, you now have two. And so you've got one for current and you've got one for potential. And yes, these can be used in the same manner that the single clamp on ground tester can be used. So this is what is commonly referred to as stakeless measurement. Yes, this is fine. You can do this in place of a clamp on, has the same advantages of being quick and easy to use. Uh, here we're looking at a lightning protection system. Now note that if you got on the tape up near the roof, you're not going to get a ground resistance measurement. Instead, you're going to get a continuity measurement around the, around the, the perimeters of, of the roof. And that may be a valuable measurement because if lightning hit and some of that broke up or whatever, or disconnected, you might want to know that. But if you wanted a ground resistance measurement, you would go down on the ground and clamp on above the ground rod and you'd get a ground resistance measurement. But again, note that in this case, uh, your test current is going to travel over to the other three ground rods. And so you have a relatively short distance of earth. And the bigger your building is, the more accurate that measurement is going to become because you're going to have larger volumes of earth to traverse with the test current. But again, the operator needs to be aware of this and take it into consideration. In some situations, a relative measurement is really all you need, and you can work with that, especially for comparative purposes to see if anything is changing. Uh, but with a building like this and a relatively short distance of earth, your ground resistance reading may be somewhat influenced by that. It may not be entirely accurate. So take that into consideration. Okay, next. Now, uh, we're going to talk about some of the uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, just a little bit of history here. Uh, on the traditional means of testing. Uh, from the time that ground testing began, which was the beginning of the 20th century, um, MEGAR has been in the uh, development of ground testers for that entire time. Uh, but for most of the century, the three and four terminal testers stayed pretty much the same the only really big change during that time came in you know, probably around the 1960s or so where uh, they went from the uh, null balance technology to microprocessors. And the old null balance instruments, probably still a few of those probably still being used. There's nothing wrong. They give you a good measurement, uh, but they're difficult to use. They take, take a lot of time. And the, uh, when they went to the microprocessors, then, of course, you had a lot of additional conveniences, speed, safety, uh, additional things that you could do. Uh, your measurement came up on the display almost immediately, and so there were a lot of advantages. Uh, but there was no real sea change in technology until about 1990, and that's when the clamp on came on the market. But for about the first 10 years, there were problems associated with it, which you should be made aware of. Um, the uh, measurements sometimes were unstable, and some of the tests that were run on them didn't work out too well. And so there, there got to be some bad 
comments in the literature, especially like mine safety and health, for instance, they banned it. Uh, they banned the use of the clamp on in the 1990s. So if you ever run into any type of objection like this, look at when it was dated. And if it was before about 1999, disregard it. Because what happened in 99 was the second generation of ground testers. Our company did not market one until that technology improved and until we could put a second generation unit on the market. And the big difference there was shielding. Uh, those early units, the, the, the turns ratio, the, the, the turns of the jaw would, uh, would cross talk and it would affect the, uh, the quality of the measurement. But the shielding improved dramatically around 1999. So any instrument since then, any good quality instrument since then, that is no longer a problem. But uh, for background information, it's good that you know. Um, so we're, we're looking at some of the advantages here, mainly that it's so easy to use. Uh, you're also getting a bonding test worked in automatically because if you see a high resistance that's too high, then instead of your ground rod, then it could be in the return path somewhere. So go up and look at your maybe your jumper from the from the neutral to the ground bus might be corroded or loose. So troubleshoot your bonding system. Uh, and then the third thing at the bottom there, it also you've got a you've got a current clamp in there, a current winding in there already. So it's a switch of the uh, selector switch you go to measure leakage current or uh, the current going to ground on your system. And when you do that, it goes from measuring the strict frequency of your test signal to broadband where it now, the, 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 uh, the uh, ammeter winding, the current winding now looks at all the current on your system if you see something up in amps, you've probably got maybe uh, a system imbalance somewhere, a load imbalance that you might want to look at. If it's in milliamps, then that's probably noise on your system. So that will help you troubleshoot your system. Next. And some of the disadvantages that we can run through, we've, uh, we've kind of, uh, touched on these already isolated grounds so you can't because you need a return path you can't do a commissioning test on a new ground that's not connected now people sometimes actually jury rig returns and you can do that uh, it'll work uh, but the, of course it's kind of defeating the purpose of using the ground tester in the first place if you do that um, and let, let's see uh, there's a couple of other, the comment there about frequency, uh, okay, uh, it's, it's less re uh, representative power, uh, of power faults because it's using a high frequency. So you might want to take that into consideration. Uh, and about accuracies being greatly reduced, uh, again, the improvements in, in technology uh, with the quality instruments have uh, largely done away with that. Okay, next. And again, we come, we've already commented on some of these points, uh, but the uh, few at the bottom there are worth mentioning uh, test standards. Okay, I actually looked this up in the latest version of IEEE 81. That, uh, that, is the, that is the standard to refer to IEEE 81 for ground testing. And it says, the clamp on ground testing method provides the operator with the ability to make effective measurements under the right conditions. And so, yes, the ground tester, in a way, is backed up by IEEE 81. And once you've taken this, seminar, this webinar, you now know what the right conditions are. So, yes, you can use it in that regard. Uh, very low grounds, again, uh, there's a slight error from the return path, which generally doesn't matter, 
but if you're trying to measure like a substation ground under one ohm, it might mean something. So just take that into consideration. And the final point, this is important. There is no built-in proof. The operator must do the test correctly and you must take what the instrument tells you as the measurement. When we have a future webinar on test techniques, uh, excuse me, on test methods, then you will see that a lot of the methods with three and four terminal testers have a proof built into them, but the clamp on does not. Okay, next. So basically we'll conclude by saying that it's a good idea if, if you're doing, a, especially if you're doing a variety of tests and uh, test environments to have a clamp on and a standard ground tester because the clamp on will, where, it's, where it is applicable, it will pay for itself quickly in terms of time saved because a three or four terminal tester takes a lot more time to use. But there are situations, as we've pointed out, where you have shorts and opens where you can't use the clamp on, and then you whip out the three or four terminal tester and go from there. Next. Okay, now we'll take a quick look at attached rod. And again, this is not an alternate technique. This is based on full of potential, a typical three or four terminal tester but it's an enhancement. Next. And uh, the advantages, of course, full of potential. Uh, one of the main disadvantages of that is you have to disconnect from the utility or otherwise you parallel in the utility ground. Next. The attached rod technique now gives you the combination of uh, the best of both worlds in the sense that you have full of potential accuracy, but you do not have to detach from the utility. Next. So now we'll take a quick look at a, at, at a brief math, uh, math exercise. I won't go into this in detail. Uh, but it, it's just an exercise. You're not actually going to do this in the real, real world. Next. So this would be a, a tester hooked up doing a full of potential test. And let's suppose it says you have about two ohms of resistance. Okay. Uh, next. Now, suppose you took an ammeter. This is not a clamp on ground tester. This would just be an ordinary ammeter. And you measure the current. Uh, so it says you've got nine milliamps, but note that some of that current is going up to the service entrance, what we show as IU utility, and going back through the grounded utility, and it's going to ground through the utility ground, which you do not want to measure. Next. So let's suppose you measured the amount of current going to the utility and you had five milliamps. Next. So now you can use Ohm's law. You know the current, you, you, the, the testers told, uh, the clamp on is giving you the, the uh, current and the testers told you the resistance. And so you can calculate out a voltage through Ohm's law. Next. And so with that, now you can also figure out now how much current is going to ground through your local ground. So that would be the total current minus the utility current. So you have four milliamps on your ground rod. Next. And with that, you could do a simple calculation again using Ohm's law and you could calculate out that instead of the 1.9 ohms that we saw with the total measurement, your local ground is actually about 4.25 ohms. Next. Now in the real world, you don't wanna do that. It's too, it's too troublesome and it wouldn't really work because clamp on milliameters 
Okay, they're going to be susceptible to other problems and other influences like we see listed here. So, next. So now we go to the attached rod technique, which, which here the uh, ammeter is plugged into the instrument itself. And so now you get all the advantages of all the protective features that are built into the, the three or four terminal tester. And so you can now rely on your measurement. Next. And this is it. Now the, the clamp, this is a current clamp and it's plugged into the tester and you hook it below your alligator clip and it measures how much current is going to ground through your local ground and it disregards what's going back through the utility ground and it bases its measurement on the local ground only and with this you can measure your on-site ground without having to lift your utility ground next and so of course the advantages of it are uh, pretty clear cut and so I don't think I need to talk about them individually. Next. And the disadvantages are merely the disadvantages that are associated with fall of potential itself. And, uh, you know, the, the, using the attached rod technique, you're not getting any additional disadvantages. So that's all to the good. Next. And here's our final slide, which we're running out of time. So I'll talk about it real quickly. Uh, this is another technology just to make you aware. This is a grid tester. These are available on the market. And what these do is test the subterranean integrity of your grid because your grid can break up underground. Uh, a, a large lightning clearance or a large fault clearance the clearance can work fine and your, your equipment isn't damaged up in the building, but your grid can break up underground from doing that. Uh, another problem is if you're in an area that's cold where you get uh, freezing and thawing, that exerts a lot of pressure on a ground grid as the, the ground literally moves as it freezes and thaws, that can break up your grid. And there's just ordinary corrosion so it may be a good idea you may still be getting pretty good uh, grounding from what's left of it but you want the whole thing there in the event that you have to uh, clear a maximum fault so you may want to test this from time to time and make sure that it's all still there and the technology of it it's a little unwieldy because it takes a big piece of instrumentation as we kind of show here a uh, big heavy instrument and it uses a large current. Uh, typical value is 300 amps that it injects into the grid. And then all you're doing is going with a clamp on ammeter and you're, you're just going around to any accessible point and measuring the current. And it should be what you injected, it should be what you see, and it should be the same from every point because the grid is supposed to be equipotential. And if you see different readings at different points, then that's telling you that there's damage to the grid. You have lack of continuity under the ground. And so you may want to do some digging and repair. And thank you very much for your attendance. That concludes the presentation part of this. And now we have a few minutes for questions. Yes. Okay. I have a Thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, now we will be shifting towards the question sessions. Uh, I have some questions here with me uh, uh, that I will try to answer uh, uh, all. So the first question is on which facts and factors number of grounding points will be uh, decided? Uh, this is more of a, a design uh, point of view question that uh, uh, not included in this webinar, but for a quick short answer for you, uh, it's depending on what type of uh, earthing system you want to do, for example, for a substation or for a building or for an industrial plant and how much uh, fault current or uh, 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 
regulated uh, regulation required for the uh, uh, place that you decide. This is one factor. Another factor is, for example, the type of soil that you are uh, uh, designing your grounding system uh, to. By the way, just for uh, 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 your information, uh, grounding here means uh, uh, same as earthing uh, systems. It's just a terminology that being used in US as grounding while uh, in Europe and in our region, it's used uh, called earthing system. So this is, I believe, answer the second question is how electrical, uh, electronic grounding is different from power grounding. Uh, uh, the electronic grounding, I believe, it's what's used in uh, uh, electronic devices as common ground uh, or return path for uh, uh, digital circuits, for example. Uh, while power grounding here, what we are referring to as earth system. Uh, another question is, uh, what is the voltage frequency in hertz applied in the uh, uh, clampless or stakeless or clamp on method? Uh, uh, our tester uh, use a frequency of 1390 hertz, it's almost 1400. The reason for that particular uh, number is to uh, uh, make the size of the clamps uh, smaller and also not to be in the harmonics or multiple of harmonics of the fundamental 50 or 60 uh, hertz. Another question I have here is, what is the acceptable measurement for different application in power and uh, telecom? Is there any uh, table? Uh, what is acceptable measurement depend on your earthing system? Usually when they designed the earthing system, they design it to be as low as a certain value, uh, usually regulated in your uh, country to a some level, depends on the application. For substation, there is a certain value for, uh, 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 for example, uh, uh, building, there is a different uh, value. Uh, uh, as for telecommunication companies, I don't have really any knowledge about uh, that. If you could please email me, I will forward it to uh, a, a, a specialist in that area that might help you further. Uh, another question is, is clamp-on method can measure the touch and step uh, voltage? No, it cannot. And also uh, continue to that question, if not, can you explain how can uh, we calculate the burden for the step and touch uh, circuit to select the suitable VA for the step and touch uh, tester? Uh, uh, I don't know exactly how uh, uh, VA or burden is uh, uh, affected in touch or uh, step and touch uh, uh, circuit testing, uh, voltage uh, testing, but what can I help you with or can I provide you with information? There is a technical guide from MIGAR, it's called Getting Down to Earth. I have uploaded this guide in the uh, handout section in the webinar uh, bin. You will find it called GDTE uh, underscore EN dot PDF. Uh, there is a section there talking in details about step and touch voltage uh, uh, test or potential. Uh, uh, and if you read that section, it, I think it will give you a good idea on how to uh, uh, achieve that uh, test and what to expect from it. Uh, in DC substation, earthing road is away from substation. Why? Uh, I believe that question might I might answer it via email. I believe because I don't have an answer uh, at the moment for uh, this question. Uh, as DC substations is not uh, uh, something I'm uh, expert in uh, to be able to answer you sufficiently for the question that you have asked. Uh, another question I have here, uh, also talking about the voltage frequency, but for the fall of potential method. 
uh, usually the fall of potential method they are using the frequency of 128 hertz uh, and the reason for that uh, I believe is that it is a frequency that is not in the uh, uh, harmonics or multiple of harmonics of uh, uh, the uh, fundamental 50 or 60 uh, hertz so they don't get a lot of interference in the uh, measurement uh, also the test signal in the fall of potential method or generally when I talk about fall of potential I'm talking about three ball or four ball uh, method uh, it's usually a, 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 a square wave not a sine wave or not a, a, a sine wave and the reason for that is to avoid, avoid uh, the polariz polarization of the uh, soil where the molecules in the soil get polarized uh, when you inject a uh, direct uh, a direct uh, dc uh, i believe that will be all for our uh, question session please whoever i have uh, instructed them to send me an email for answer the one asking about the telecom uh, uh, grounding system, uh, please uh, email me this uh, uh, request and I will answer you. I will leave my email to you in the chat. So you can communicate to me. Uh, thank you very much for uh, attending with us uh, for this webinar. There are four minutes left in case of anyone want to ask any question. Uh, uh, please, you have uh, four minutes for that. Otherwise, after that, I will have to end this session uh, uh, and see you next time. Uh, uh, well. Just got another question is uh, uh, please send the recorded webinar and slides. The uh, recording of this webinar will be sent automatically at the end of this uh, webinar after one hour or from uh, the end of this webinar, uh, as well as the slides are already uh, in the handout section. You will find it in the handout section. Uh, you will find an attachment called clambone uh, art webinar. Uh, 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 template and a PDF file uh, have all the slides in it. Another question just came in as well. Uh, please tell us uh, what is available of accessories and devices uh, 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 and what do we need from them. We have a device called DET24C uh, uh, which is a clamp on a tester. You can find it in our uh, uh, Megar uh, website. It is a dedicated device to do uh, uh, clamp on uh, testing. Uh, and also, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, an accessories for the three ball and four ball tester that we have that also can give you a, a, a stateless test. It's usually a dual clamp, two clamps you connect as an optional accessories to your uh, air tester from Megar to be able to do stakeless or uh, uh, even art uh, method or attached road technique. We have about uh, uh, 30 uh, seconds of this webinar time. I thank you uh, very much for attending with us today. I hope.
this webinar session was beneficial uh, uh, to you. Thank you very much and have a nice uh, day.